today we're going to be hearing some important voices in the movement um, on how to bring about a just peace in Ukraine. And what that means is not always clear to everyone, especially in the context of the total blackout of the corporate media of any person or media outlet who differs from the U.S. State Department version of what is the truth in Ukraine. The underlying narrative that you hear from the United States is, um, and from the corporate media and its social media, is that um, Russia invaded Ukraine. It did so basically because it is evil and it wants to expand. And um, it is a country that is run by an evil dictator. Um, this is the narrative that's coming across the United States. It also is that the war started on February 24th of this year. None of that is really the case. Uh, the case is that um, around the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, promises were made to Gorbachev that NATO would never expand to the west of Germany. Uh, those promises simply were not kept. Russia felt this was very important for its own security. And in fact, 14 of those countries to the east of Germany are now members of NATO, and they wanted the Ukraine to also be a member of NATO. The Ukraine with a very, very large border of, with, the, um, with Russia that could have put nuclear capable missiles within minutes of Moscow. And so that was a red line that Russia said it could not go along um, with. It had to stop it with that red line that uh, Ukraine had to be neutral. We insisted that uh, uh, Ukraine could become part of NATO. Had the United States just said the opposite, this war may have been stopped at that point. The United States recognizes no legitimate security concerns for Russia. Um, bringing nuclear capable missiles to the border of Russia, doing war games right on the Russian border, which NATO has done, is kind of the reverse of what we saw with the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was a red line for the United States. The United States was ready to go to World War III over that. Fortunately, we were able to back down from that position. But the United States has not backed down um, from the position of bringing uh, Ukraine uh, into NATO. Um, the hot side of the war, the fighting and shooting, also didn't start this year. It started in 2014 when the U.S. helped um, bring a coup um, to uh, Kiev, to the capital of, um, uh, of Ukraine. What started out as peaceful demonstrations against corruption um, uh, in Ukraine um, uh, was uh, ended up as a, a very uh, violent kind of confrontation as neo-Nazis uh, came into uh, uh, Kiev, supported by the United States. Uh, people were shot uh, and the legitimate government of Ukraine was overthrown. Uh, that government was um, headed by a party called the Party of Regions, which was the largest party in Ukraine, which wanted to have better relationships with Russia as well as, as Europe. And the United States did not want to see that. And it's one of the reasons we brought the coup in. We heard who became the uh, leader afterwards, first from Victoria Nuland, uh, when she insisted that Arsene Yetsenuk um, become the a leader after the coup. He's someone that came from um, uh, a party that was a, a right-wing neo-Nazi party that uh, traced its origins back to the, to the Nazi collaborator, uh, Stepan Bandera, and he became the leader right after the coup. The two largest parties, the Party of Regions and the Communist Party were both banned. The Russian language was banned, and there were protests throughout the country against the coup. Uh, these were put down by the military, by the police, and by Nazi gangs, um, most notably in the city of Odessa, where there was a massacre 
of the people protesting the coup. 48 were killed, hundreds were wounded in that massacre. Crimea decided it no longer wanted to be part of Ukraine after this and went back to Russia, which it had been part of for hundreds of years before the 1950s. Um, there was uprisings throughout the Donbass in the eastern region, uh, and two areas declared themselves independent regions, the People's Republic of Donetsk and Lugansk. Uh, uh, Neo-Nazis came into parts of this and tried to put down this with the military. There was a fighting that took uh, place in Marupol, uh, and they were able to take back that area. Um, but the fighting has continued since 2014, and 14,000 people have been killed in that region. That's where the war started. That's not said anywhere. It simply said it started in uh, the beginning of this year when Russia came in. And what happened in the beginning of this year was Ukraine massed around 150,000 troops on the border of Donbass. They started massive shelling of the independent areas uh, civilian areas. Um, and then they crossed the line of demarcation into the uh, Donbass area. Um, when Russia saw this, uh, what was happening, they decided to recognize the two independent areas and said they would defend them. Russian troops then came in and there's been a war going on ever since. So today we want to talk a little bit about um, what uh, is going on with that war right now. Uh, and we also want to talk about what response the anti-war movement should have to this. There's a lot of confusion with this right now um, on what role we should take and um, what, what is happening there. And so we're going to start with this. Um, so I'm going to ask Ajamu Baraka um, to start this discussion. Uh, he is uh, the national organizer of the Black Alliance for Peace, a very significant organization to have a Black peace organization in the United States is, is a very significant thing. He serves on the executive committee of the U.S. Peace Council. Um, both of those groups are members of UNAC. Uh, he's on the administrative committee of UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition. He is the editor and uh, contributing columnist for Black Agenda Report, another very significant uh, news outlet that has been telling the truth um, for a long period of time since its founding, and he's a contributing columnist to Counterpunch. He was recently awarded the U.S. Peace Memorial uh, Award in 2019 and the Serena Sim Award for Uncompromising Integrity in Journalism. So we're first going to ask um, Ajamu to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank everyone who showed up this afternoon to engage in this very important conversation. As Joe just indicated, uh, we have some challenges as a, a peace movement, as an anti-imperialist movement, as a consequence of this conflict in Ukraine. Uh, we don't have to talk about the fact that this conflict has um, initiated some very serious tensions among uh, the pro-peace and anti-war and anti-imperialist uh, elements in this country and really uh, throughout the Western world. Uh, and so these kinds of conversations that allow us to talk among ourselves, to struggle through the various positions, to see if we can find a, a minimal program uh, that will allow us to reconstitute and concentrate our power in order that we are more effective in trying to move toward a world in which there will be no more interstate violence, no more war, where there can in fact be peace. That is vitally important. In fact, I will argue it is our primary responsibility as human beings and as members of this, of this community. Now, I'm not going to get into all of the uh, issues around, uh, as we say, who shot John, that is, you know, how we got into this situation with this uh, conflict. I'll just share this, though, that from our analysis, uh, that is, those of us in the Black Alliance of Peace, uh, we say, at minimum, 
that this conflict could have and should have been avoided, that the war did not start in February. Uh, and in fact, uh, this conflict as it unfolded through uh, 2021, uh, we define as a manufactured conflict. But we don't want to even debate that because our position is this. If you really want to understand Ukraine, we say we need to uh, decenter Europe and focus on imperialism. That the issue for us is in fact imperialism and the lens that it will take. And imperialism we define basically as uh, the imperialist states that we see as our primary, as the primary uh, drivers of, of instability, the primary threats to international peace, we see emanating primarily from the West under the hegemony, under the leadership, if you will, of the United States of America. And we see the lens that, that uh, the U.S. would go. We see how dangerous the current environment is today. As a consequence of trying to galvanize European solidarity uh, against uh, Russia, uh, we see that uh, agreements have been made to allow uh, Germany to basically rearm. We see that the Japanese are moving toward uh, rearming. We see the kind of belligerence that uh, emanated from the meetings uh, between the President uh, Biden and the new president uh, in South Korea, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, North Korea. Uh, we see the kinds of moves being made on the African continent where the U.S. has encouraged uh, its vassal states like Rwanda and Uganda uh, to begin to be the police of uh, 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 the eastern and southern parts of the African continent. Uh, we see that uh, Biden has expanded or redeployed U.S. troops back to Somalia, even after uh, Trump took troops out. And even after it appears once again that they were moving in Somalia toward uh, a African solution to an African problem. But of course, you can't, you can't do that when you're still under the hills of the global uh, North uh, and, and the, the hegemon of the United States of America. So troops are going back to Somalia. On the African continent, they have the audacity uh, under this bill by Gregory Meeks uh, to impose on African states that they are not able to exercise their own sovereignty, their own foreign policy. That this bill that is being pushed is that if you don't do what George Bush said uh, around the uh, Iraqi war, if you're not you know, either with the US, then you are opposed to the US. So if you don't uh, uh, accept the definitions of, of how the Ukrainian situation is being defined, if you don't in, embrace and include uh, yourself, your national uh, interests with those of the West, then you're going to be punished by the United States of America. And keep in mind and remind ourselves, these sanctions, this, this arbitrary gangsterism, this is just what it is, it's gangsterism. These are criminal acts, they are illegal. And we need to remind ourselves of that and remind this movement of that. The subversion in Latin America, this, this summit of the Americas coming up where uh, the U.S. arbitrarily decides that they're not going to invite uh, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, and Nicaragua. Um, this is a situation that we are facing, that with this, 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 this effort to, to maintain global uh, hegemony, it doesn't matter what kind of impact this conflict has on anyone. We, they know that basically this conflict is going to have, is, is having a detrimental impact on the entire world. That basically we know there's going to be almost 500 million Africans who are being uh, negatively impacted by this war. We know that they have shifted the burden, the, the, the cost of this war uh, to the working class in the U.S. with inflation, with higher gas and food prices. While these, these, these criminals that own and control the military industrial complex are making record profits. So my friends, we have before us a real task. Because not only do you have this, this instability and this dangerous international uh, situation, domestically, 
we have a growing dangerous situation because when you have aggressive militarism externally, you have to have containment domestically. And we see that under the uh, the war party, party, the Democrats, we see that uh, uh, there's more money for the police. Uh, we see the moves being made to increase censorship, surveillance and repression. Um, and we see this dangerous phenomenon of the Democrats and everybody else whitewashing the existence of literal neo-Nazis in Ukraine and attempting to try to reframe these white supremacist ultra-nationalists in that state, pretending like it doesn't exist or it's the, the creation of the, of, uh, the, the figment of, of, of Putin's imagination. Where well, just a few years, a few, few months ago, they were talking about how corrupt and how dangerous those forces were uh, in Ukraine. So we can't play with this because we understand that these folks are, are committed to maintaining the hegemony. They say it basically in their documents. The national security strategy of the U.S. says it's committed to the doctrine of full spectrum dominance. It's clear. So when people began to make this, this equivalency between uh, uh, U.S. and U.S. And, and Western imperialism and the imperialism of Russia with their $1.9 trillion dollars, uh, and there are a few bases outside of this sphere of influence versus the U.S. with its $21 trillion, 800 to 1,000 bases. Um, you know, it makes no sense because basically what you were doing, you were disarming opposition, you were confusing people, you were disrupting and, dis and, and making it more difficult for us to mobilize against the primary, the primary enemy, the primary threat to international peace. So we say... Uh, and in and, and Black Alliance of Peace, uh, we are so glad that we are part of UNAC because UNAC is upholding the, the anti-imperialist perspective. We embrace and we love uh, our, our, our pro-peace uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, we believe it's important that we have a, a commitment to peace. We, have, we are committed to peace also, but we understand that what we're up against now, what we are in fact fighting against, is not being driven by, by, by morality. It's being driven by material interests. And the material interest of the West right now is to maintain their global uh, hegemony. And we have to understand that because we have to understand that we're not going to be able to eliminate war uh, in this country and globally. Uh, we can't construct the conditions for peace uh, until we take power from these perpetrators of violence. They have declared war on humanity. Um, and we have to understand what, in fact, uh, we are up against. We say this imperialist war is being waged against collective humanity. Uh, we need to take the opportunity to turn this imperial, these imperialist wars into wars against imperialism. Uh, we have to build movement, my friends. Uh, we encourage everyone who's concerned about war, who wants to see its elimination, who wants to see the possibility of a new society, join an organization that's fighting for societal transformation. Struggle as though your life depended on it because it does. When we do that, when we commit ourselves to a new vision of what we can be as, as human beings, when we understand that we can, in fact, put the planet and people and peace before profits, we would be well on the way of developing the conditions to transform ourselves and this world. And we can say then, with that slogan we always use, all power to the people. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. Now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, who is Sarah Flounders. She's the co-coordinator of the International Action Center. She's a writer for the Workers' World newspaper. She's a member of the UNAC Administrative Committee, the author of several books, and she has tra traveled extensively in countries that have been under attack by U.S. imperialism uh, to report and express solidarity with them. So next we'll hear from Sarah. I want to open by saying I so agree with Ajamu that imperialism is the instigator. We are not in a new Cold War, a long stalemate stretching decades. 
We are in a world war, an enormously dangerous war that is not just a conflict in Donbass. The whole world is at risk, at risk of famines that are predicted to sweep whole continents, supply chain disruptions of the most essential medicines. This war in Ukraine is a turning point, a watershed, a huge change vibrating around the world. There's a fragmentation and a realignment and US imperialism will not allow any country to be neutral. The US and EU sanctions will create famines throughout Africa. UN agencies are making ominous warnings of the impact of inflation and shortages in the whole developing world. US sanctions against India are threatened under the countering America adversaries, adversities through Sanctions Act. There's more US sanctions threatened and already imposed on Turkey, a NATO member for their continuing trade with Russia. And after Pakistan continued its trade, Washington orchestrated a coup against the government of Imran Khan. U.S. sanctions on more than 40 countries already disrupt the economy and the lives of millions of people in Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America. Now, who pays the price inside the U.S.? Really, the cost of U.S. militarism and and, and the military offensives will wipe out all of President Biden's election promises and the gains of past generations of workers' struggles. Build back better infrastructure programs, that's off the table, COVID relief, preparation for other health emergencies, student debt relief, every other promised social program, environmental program is off the agenda. The challenge for us is can the working class in the US and in Europe intervene with our own demands in this challenge? That is the challenge. And let's be clear, US corporate war is not in our interests. International solidarity, the struggle against racism, the struggle against US wars can be a powerful weapon if it's organized. Now, the war in Ukraine is a military struggle and Russia has made some gains. It's a political struggle. Finland and Norway are being roped into the NATO war machine with no vote of their own population, no consultation even with other NATO countries. But war in this imperialist era are fundamentally about economics. It's economic interests that drive nation states to war. And what does you, uh, do the U.S. corporations want out of this war? That's what we should look at. It was planned for years. Ukraine is the war front of NATO's choosing, not of Russia's. It's a proxy, yes, in a struggle to gain supremacy over its allies, its allies in the European Union, and to forcibly delink Russia from its extensive and mutually profitable trade with Europe. U.S. policy is seeking now to grind down Russia's resources in a long and costly military onslaught. The U.S. has instigated the crisis by in encircling Russia with NATO bases, organizing constant military operations, supplying weapons to Ukraine to fire near Russia's border for eight years. Washington orchestrated the color revolution as it's called in Ukraine in 2004, before its far more extreme coup in 2014 using fascist forces. Thousands of US NATO military trainers, mercenaries and equipment has already destroyed Ukraine's neutrality. Ukraine is a de facto member of the US commanded NATO military alliance. Make no mistake. The problem is that even after the 2014 coup and the US sanctions at that time, the trade continued and actually escalated between Russia and the EU to the great frustration of US strategists. There was still a growing integration of the EU trade and investment with Russia and with China. This favorable trade challenges the domination of US corporate power in Europe, and it challenges U.S. global hegemony. 
The immediate threat to U.S. hegemony is that the EU trade with Russia was at 260 billion a year, 10 times the EU trade with the U.S. And the European Union was the largest investor in Russia. So breaking this growing economic integration of the EU with Russia and at an even greater level with China serves the long-term strategic interests of U.S. corporate domination that has been in place since World War II. U.S. government strategists are using sanctions as a wrecking ball to demolish the globalized economy. For 40 years, globalization was promoted in a unipolar world. So this war is a desperate struggle to preserve U.S. Glo global hegemony, and they will destroy what they have built because if it's not now in their immediate interests, how dangerous. The policy of consciously demolishing supply chains of essential products, grain, fertilizer, energy, it amounts to a reckless war on defenseless civilian populations. U.S. sanctions disrupt trade worldwide, send shockwaves far beyond the countries directly targeted. President Biden said as much in a Brussels uh, NATO press conference. He said, food shortages, it's going to be real. The price of sanctions is not just imposed upon Russia. It's imposed upon an awful lot of countries as well, including European countries and our country as well. Direct quote. His ominous warning, for the first time, this intentional disruption is hitting the countries imposing the sanctions. It's creating unprecedented inflation, the highest in 40 years and climbing, supply chain ca chaos, sharply higher costs for energy, for industries, transport, homes. And look at the stock market slide right here. There's British predictions that 40% of their population will have to choose between eating and heating. What a choice. Washington is demanding that countries act against their own economic interests and enforce sanctions passed as U.S. legislation in which they had no voice or prior notice. Now, why is Russia targeted? Russia has a capitalist economy that's much smaller than the U.S., the world's largest economy. Russia also confronts the economic power of not just the US, but the combined economic power of the EU, Japan, South Korea, Australia. The Russian economy today is smaller than Canada or the South Korean economy. Russia's defense budget is one twelfth US military spending. And this ratio shrinks even further when weighed against a budget of the entire NATO military alliance of 30 countries. So while Russia is neither a military or an economic threat, it has enormous natural resources great, that are presently out of U.S. control. And that is what makes Russia a target. President Biden confidently promised that the U.S. and EU sanctions would have a catastrophic impact on Russia's economy. There were predictions of Russia, Russia's bank and stock market collapse, hyperinflation, soaring prices, empty shelves, massive unemployment. This was calculated to disintegrate the Russian state. Graphic descriptions of what the impact on the poorest Russians and the middle class were abounding. And politicians said there was nothing that the Russian government could do. They were hostage to the seizure of all their assets by Western banks. This was short-sighted arrogance. U.S. war planners ignored that Russia is self-sufficient in grains, in meats, in other proteins, and in energy. And its trade with China, India, Brazil, Iran ensures that industry will not collapse for lack of spare parts. The U.S. cut Russia off from the swift banking system of payments and trade. Visa and MasterCard shut down overnight. They did not, however, create pre predicted chaos. The Central Bank of Russia was able to switch to the Chinese SIPS network of 3,000 banking institutions in 167 countries and seamlessly process credit card transactions. 
So what's forgotten in the, in the congratulatory declarations was throughout the developing economies of the world. Uh, there's, okay, there's no agreement on US imposed sanctions. The response of many countries to the extensive sanctions has opened new forms of currency exchange. I'll just finish with this. Uh, and in turn has led to an erosion of dollar supremacy, the bedrock of US economic hegemony. Full spectrum dominance can't be enforced at this point. This is growing and it's more dangerous. The resistance of China, the world's largest economy to US demands to comply. This is even more serious. The BRICS countries have all resisted. That's India, South Africa, Brazil, and China. The countries of Africa and Latin America aren't going along with this. So there's a big change underway and a big struggle, open defiance. There's payments now that are in Russian rubles and rupees and Chinese yuan. So all of these are changes we need to see. And at the same time, U.S. think tank tanks are talking about how to sanction China, an economy 10 times the size of Russia. So it shows that they are not slowing their preparation. And this is what we need to be aware of. There's an international movement to oppose NATO's current war in the Ukraine, and it needs to know what else is on the drawing board. And we need, we have an urgent need for a global campaign against economic sanctions. It's a crime against humanity and a real campaign against the NATO military machine. So that's what we're talking about. That's what we're for. And I think it's a whole approach in the movement. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we're now gonna go to Scott Ritter. Uh, Scott is a former US Marine Corps intelligence officer who served for 20 years, 20 plus years, um, including a tour of duty in the former Soviet Union implementing the arms control agreement. He was a chief weapons inspector for the United Nations in Iraq. And he put his career and his livelihood um, in jeopardy by speaking truth to power during that period and stating what the US government did not want you to hear, that no weapons of mass destruction were found in Iraq. Um, and today, as we see uh, war brewing, not just against the third world country, but against a country that is a major nuclear power, which brings the possibility of nuclear war and the destruction of the entire planet um, into the equation, Scott once again um, chose to speak truth to power and started speaking out about what the realities are in the war um, in Ukraine. The floor is yours, Scott. Thanks, Joe. Um, well, let me let me uh, start. I'm, I'm going to talk. You know, this is an anti-war um, forum, uh, but I think to be against war. You, you need to understand war, you need to put it in a proper perspective. And so I'm going to talk about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine from a, a primarily a military uh, and uh, geopolitical uh, standpoint. I think Joe gave a very, uh, a very good and thorough introduction to the conflict. Um, and, you know, and, and, and people should know that it just didn't pop into Vladimir Putin's imagination on uh, February 24th to, uh, to invade Ukraine. Uh, there, there are several competing um, uh, strategies at place here or in place, but um, we, we need to understand uh, some terminology. Uh, the first term I think we need to grasp is uh, special military operation. Uh, Russia is not at war with Ukraine. Now, I'm not playing semantics here. People say guns go pop and people die and shells go boom. And what's the difference? There's a whole world of difference. Um, Russia has, if you know anything about Russia, about their leadership, uh, Putin, et cetera, very legalistic, very structured way of, of, of approaching business. And uh, this includes the business of war or conflict. Um, what we have here is a special military operation that is authorized by Russia's interpretation of Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. Uh, Russia has articulated a case for conflict um, 
built around the notion of preemptive collective self-defense. Article 51, if you know anything about the UN Charter, speaks only of self-defense. Um, but over time, uh, the, the international community has accepted a couple of concepts. One is preemptive self-defense, that you don't have to wait to be punched in the face to, uh, to hit someone to stop them from punching you. Um, the United States has cited the, the need for preemptive <laughs> self-defense in, uh, in, in, in justifying its conflict in Iraq in 2003. There we have a, an obvious case of uh, the abuse of this concept. Uh, NATO um, in, in, invoked preemptive self-defense uh, when talking about uh, Serbia and Kosovo, again, based upon manufactured claims of uh, genocide, et cetera. The, the wrong case. So it's not it's not something that's withstood the test of time in terms of um, adding a, a shine to its uh, to the legitimacy of its argument. Uh, but it's there. Uh, it dates back to actually to a, a case in U.S. history, the Caroline incident incident in 1837 uh, involving a U.S. ship and British ships off the coast of Maine. Uh, just a piece of uh, history there. But um, the other aspect is collective self defense. And what's important here is this was first coined by NATO against uh, uh, Serbia. If you notice that NATO is not a member of the United Nations, so how dare NATO invoke the United Nations Charter? It's not a member. But uh, NATO was able, using its member states, to come up with the notion of collective self-defense, inclusive of the NATO uh, alliance. Uh, so you can have in this, this collection, UN members and non-UN members coming together to be covered by the UN Security Council, uh, the UN uh, Charter. So preemptive collective self-defense, that's Russia's claim. And what's important there is that Russia built this claim based upon its uh, acceptance of the declarations of independence of both the Lugansk and Donetsk republics in the Donbas. Prior to this, um, Russia had, uh, during the entire time from 2014 up until the initiation of this conflict, Russia had viewed what was going on in the Donbas as an internal Ukrainian problem. Uh, Russia refused to accept the, uh, the declarations of independence of these nations, and Russia had said, this is a Ukrainian problem, we will defend the rights of the Russians, but uh, Donbass is an integral part of Ukraine. Had Russia con continued with this uh, argument, it would have no justification under international law to intervene, because it's an internal Ukrainian problem. So Russia has constructed an argument premised on the independence of Lugansk and Donetsk, combined with Russia to create a collective self-defense concern, which then had a preemptive aspect to it because of the imminent threat posed by Ukrainian forces uh, that Joe had mentioned building up in eastern uh, Ukraine to attack. So the special military operation is designed to address this problem. That's a long way of saying that um, what existed in February 24 no longer exists today. The Russians have continued to call it a special military operation and their legal justification for um, fighting in Ukraine remains the same. Um, but the war itself has changed. This is no longer about liberating Donbass. And that's not because Russia changed the terms of the conflict. It's because the United States and NATO changed the terms of the conflict. The United States and NATO started uh, on February 24th saying, we, uh, we don't plan on getting involved. Uh, the United States will not come to the defense of Ukraine. NATO will not come to the defense of Ukraine. Um, and we're in the alliance was going to limit its support to the continued provision of light weapons. In fact, many people in the NATO and the United States believe this conflict was going to be over very soon. Mark Miley, the general chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, testified for the U.S. Congress in the lead up to the conflict that he thought Kiev would fall within five days and Ukraine would surrender, surrender within a week or two. Uh, so there was no long term plan. As the Russian phase one faltered, um, whatever term you want to use, let's just say that it wasn't firing on all cylinders. Uh, they didn't even call it phase one, so we didn't know there was a phase one at first started. We just had a Russian operation. Um, but it had problems, and I think most of those problems stem from a failure of intelligence on the part of the Russians. Uh, they were led to believe that the Ukrainian army would, uh, in large part, stay in their barracks, that the civilian leaders would support uh, Russian troops. The opposite was the truth, and Russia took a bloody nose on several fronts. This didn't mean Russia was losing. It just meant Russia that the operation didn't go exactly the way Russia wanted. And this breathed hope into uh, 
Ukraine and its NATO supporters, and they began to provide new web kinds of weaponry, heavy weaponry, et cetera. But this was done in a panicked manner. Um, you know, send over 50 U Ukrainian forces to Germany, train the trainers, send them back in. Um, it was very inefficient. It was very chaotic. Um, and it wasn't particularly helping the uh, Ukrainian cause. Um, the Russians hit a pause sometime in uh, mid-March and, um, and announced that they were moving into phase two of the operation. Phase two um, dealt primarily with completing the mission set forth by the special military operation of liberating uh, the Donbass region, Lugansk, Donetsk, uh, securing water supplies for Crimea and completing a land bridge connecting Crimea with the Russian Federation. And that's what we're seeing right now, phase two. Phase two has a couple military objectives beyond the territorial ones I discussed. One is denazification, the other one is demilitarization. And these are linked to two political objectives. That is a, a permanently neutral Ukraine. And uh, by defeating Ukraine and defeating Ukraine's effort to become a NATO member, helping create the conditions for a restructuring of European security framework, uh, which Russia would like to involve the withdrawal of NATO's military technical capacity back to pre-1997 borders, that is, before the major expansion of NATO. Um, Russia is not, uh, Russia is winning impressive battles on the field. In fact, is, I just was watching the, the news today. Um, today is a very dramatic day on the battlefield. Russia is taking hundreds, if not thousands of prisoners. Uh, they're breaking through the lines. They are closing cauldrons, surrounding tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops. Um, They've virtually liberated all of the Donbass, and they're in the process of destroying much of the Ukrainian military that's arrayed against them. Had this been the case totally based upon the, the, the Ukrainian uh, military organization that existed on February 24th, this war would be over. But since that time, NATO has, in the United States, has uh, injected, uh, the U.S. alone, $53 billion worth of military-related assistance. To give you a perspective, the Russian military budget for all of the Russian military in 2021 was $43 billion. So in the first four months of, um, of 2022, the United States and NATO have provided Ukraine with $10 billion more than Russia spent in totality on its military in 2021. This is a game changer. Now, some of this equipment is garbage. A lot of this money is gonna be squandered in, uh, in, in waste, fraud, and abuse. Ukraine is one of the most notoriously corrupt nations on the planet. But $53 billion, even if only 20% of this makes it to the front line, that's still a whole bunch of military equipment. It doesn't mean that Ukraine's going to win the war. What it does mean though, is that the game has changed. Russia is facing a completely different set of facts today from a military perspective than they were confronting in February 24th of, of this year when the special military operation said, Ukraine, and NATO, Ukraine is a de facto NATO proxy force carrying out a newly enunciated US NATO policy of strategic defeat of Russia by bleeding them dry in Ukraine meaning that all of this material that's being provided to Ukraine is not being provided to help Ukraine win the war. It's helping Ukraine kill Russians in a recurring conflict, at which, as I just said, also produces thousands of dead Ukrainians. This is literally a meat grinder taking place in Ukraine today, one that Russia is winning on the battlefield, but because the scope and scale of the conflict have enlarged so much, Russia is not achieving demilitarization. Every military force they're destroying on the battlefield is being re reconstituted as we speak in Germany and Poland, where thousands of Ukrainian troops are receiving training by NATO and being equipped by NATO before being sent back into Ukraine. Um, it's hard to demilitarize when the reconstitution is taking place in a strategic depth that is outside the reach of the Russian military. So this is, Again, NATO providing strategic depth to Ukraine. NATO is providing intelligence information. At the beginning of the war, it was strategic in nature, broad brush picture of what Russia's intentions were. Now it's tactical in nature, very focused intelligence that enables Ukraine to sink Russian ships, to attack Russian oil uh, refineries on Russian soil, and to kill Russian generals. And 
more simply put, to kill Russian troops on the battlefield. Uh, NATO is a participant in this conflict. Scott. So anybody who is hoping that Russia could deliver a knockout blow, get Ukraine knocked to its feet, teach NATO a lesson, that's not happening. And that's very disturbing because if you're anti-war, I guess the message I'm going to leave you with is unless Russia changes its posture towards this conflict, this war is not going to end for a very long time. And worse, for Russia to shorten this war, they have to go to war, meaning no more special military operation. Russia is going to have to declare war against Ukraine and possibly other European nations affect a general mobilization that involves millions of uh, men and um, put Europe at, at more risk than it has been at any time since uh, the Second World War. That's, uh, that's the current military situation. It's not very pro-peace at all. Thank you, Scott. Our final speaker, last but not least, is Alan Freeman. He is the co-director um, of a Geopolitical Economic Research Group at the University of Manitoba. He's economist um, at the Greater London uh, Authority between uh, 20, uh, 2000 and 2011, where he held uh, a brief for the creative industries um, and the living wage. Uh, he's a writer, um, an economist. He's uh, one of the leaders of a newly found organization called the International Manifesto Group. You're on, Alan. I want to talk about the left's place in the peace movement. Now, that's a vast topic, and it's pretty controversial, both for the peace movement and for the left, probably for the right, too. So most of what I have to get over is actually in uh, an, a series of documents which I've placed on my academia site. And this document itself is on the academia site, along with links if you want to dig deeper or get involved. Now I'm going to start with a, a trillion dollar question. If NATO won, if the DPR and LPR forces surrendered and the Russian army was driven back to the border, would the world be a better or a worse place? This is a practical question. You can't resolve it with abstract ideals or theories, like whether Ukraine has a sacred right to rule over the Russian speakers of the Donbass, or whether Russia is imperialist. Any more than Palestinian rights can be settled by referring to the historical origins of the people of the book. The lives of millions, maybe billions of people, are at stake, I will show. If the Russian army leaves Ukraine, they will all suffer and many will die. Now, if your ideals tell you that that's a good thing, if along with Madeleine Albright, you can look on the death of half a million Iraqi children and say it was worth it, then your ideals are wrong. If your theory tells you to arm Ukraine to the teeth and give its fascists free reign to cleanse it of Russian and Russian speakers, you're free to say that, which is a lot more freedom than we've got in speaking up against you, but you're not part of the left. Because if anyone tries to justify a monstrous and unnecessary human sacrifice on the grounds that it's for the best, you're measuring good in dollars, not bodies, and you're not part of the left because the left stands for humans, not money. What will happen if the Russian army leaves? First, there will be a bloody racial cleansing of a third of Ukrainian territory where 14 million Russian speakers live. You don't need an elaborate theory or analysis to see that. You just look at what's been happening. For the past eight years, the Donbass has been under continuous and illegal military attack for no greater crime than demanding autonomy and standing up to murderers. This is not the work of a handful of rightists. It's baked into the concept of nation, which Ukraine's rulers promote and NATO supports. Stripped of elegant excuses, this holds that being ethnically Russian is incompatible with Ukrainian nationality. This is a thoroughly racist notion. Azov merely enforces what everybody promotes with a soft glove by killing and torturing those who oppose it, for which they once got nods and winks, but now they get acclaim. 
as national heroes. The so the soul the the left so-called left support for it is a travesty. That's also why war is not just an invasion, but a civil war. This was inevitable given the national concept. Imagine if the USA were to ban Spanish, what might happen in, let's say, California? Or suppose Canada banned French, not even outside Quebec, but in Quebec itself, the country would fall apart. What about, and that's the origin of the conflict. That's the true origin of the conflict, a suppressive concept of nation. But what about Russia itself? Maybe a NATO victory would free it of the Putin yoke. No. What NATO wants to do is install a Western puppet who will sell off Russia's resources to the highest bidder. To see this as liberation is to ignore basic facts. When the Soviet Union dissolved, the average standard of living fell to one fifth of what it was. Over three million people died. Life expectancy fell by five years. In World War II, over 26 million Soviet citizens died. That's why Putin has such wide popular support in Russia. A pro-Western successor could only rule by terror. Like Zelensky, that great Democrat who has banned 11 opposition parties and is busy jailing their members for treason. So what about the alternatives? Let's use the right name for the alternative. It's a NATO defeat, not a Ukrainian defeat. Russia's enemy is not the people of Ukraine, but NATO, which is fighting it to the last Ukrainian. For NATO, the Ukrainian people are pawns. At stake is a deeply unjust world order that consigns four fifths of the world to a status of economic slavery by denying the economic sovereignty without which self-determination is an empty slogan. What exactly is so terrifying about a NATO defeat, folks? NATO is the spawn of a parasitic financial military elite that would rather destroy the world than surrender an ounce of privilege. The Western left has opposed it for 70 years in Vietnam, Latin America, the Middle East and Africa. Yet now it finally faces a setback large enough to get some sense of reason into its leaders and rein it in. This same left views the prospect with horror. Why? Just look at what's happening already. Provoked by the failure of the US attempts to asphyxiate the Russian economy, quote unquote, by cutting it out of the world financial and trading system, this same system is self-destructing. The dollar monopoly of trade is disappearing. This rids the financial military elite of two weapons which have held back the global south for generations, US control of trade and US control of finance. If this was completed, it would free countries to trade as they wish. The coercive power of sanctions would be limited to supplies of high tech of which US still has a monopoly, but the gaps rapidly being closed by China's remarkable advances. The dollar monopoly of finance is also on life support because people are building alternative regional blocks. And if this was completed, it would free countries of the tyrannical yoke of neoliberalism. They would no longer be defenseless against smash and grab raids by rapacious Western investors who only concern is to lay hands on their minerals, food stuff and cheap labor at minimum cost to themselves and with maximum cost to the damage to the planet and its peoples. Countries would then be free to focus on the needs of their own people, on food security and on economic and human development and ecological development. This would further deprive the authoritarian regimes of the South, which certainly exist, of two levers that keep them in power, access to Western finance and the fear that Washington's little enforcers will punish them mercilessly if they do anything to their people. Countries would then be free to choose leaders that respect the needs of their people instead of the corrupt elites of their countries and of the United States and its allies. If you need proof, just look at Latin America. Country after country is boycotting a US summit of the Americas because it excluded Cuba and Venezuela. Look at the CELAC conference where Mexico's law players Obrador openly advocated an independent economic and political union for Latin America and the Caribbean. Look at the reactions of China's BRICS partners to Xi, Jinping's proposed, Xi Jinping's proposal. They not only expand their group, but, and I quote, oppose hegemonism and power politics, resist Cold War thinking and block confrontation, and build a community with shared security for mankind together.
Look at the volt fuss of a US leadership, which finally addressing Maduro as president, has just now offered to begin lifting illegal and punitive sanctions it was trying to use to starve the Venezuelan people into submission. Not out of any moral, uh, you know, epiphany, but simply because they need to grab some more oil and that's the only way they can get it. So finally, why does this call for a powerful left, because that's what I'm going to advocate, but a very different left? What should that left be like? Well, first of all, if you think that the right is part of the answer, and that's quite a widespread illusion, I suggest you wait for Ted Cruz to, to endorse what's going on in Latin America. It will be a long wait. I think the end times will probably come first. That's because the fright fundamentally considers money more important than people. And that's what helps us define what the left should be, and which it's not now, which is actually the intention of its founders, an alliance between the working and poor people of all countries based on the common needs of all humanity, not just one privileged part of it, and least of all on the racial fantasy that any one part of humanity is born superior to another. Such a left in the Western world hardly exists. It is rotted from within under the hubristic delusion that so-called Western civilization entitles it to tell everybody else what to do. It is worshiped at that terrible altar where Mammon and Mars consummated their union. It has been rewarded by being sacrificed on that altar. And it will therefore be able to do nothing, even for its own people, as we're now seeing in what the Biden administration is doing to the people of the USA. Peace calls for a global left that truly represents the working and poor people of the whole world, recognizes all of them as genuine equals and places their common rights and their common needs above those of property owners and their profits. That's my definition of the left. And it was the definition of the founders. We've strayed from that path and we need to come back to it. Such a left is also the only path to peace. Educated by the struggles of our sisters and brothers of the South and the East, and in concert with them, and with due respect for what they have gone through and what they have achieved, I hope we can start building it. Thank you once again.